Why do people say that God cannot be defined? These and other questions are what we shall explore this morning. Of all the literature that I have read in Vedanta, the very best definition of God that I have come across, the very best definition of Brahman that I have come across, is what I'll, I'll share today, this morning. In all the literature, not only Vedanta or the Upanishads, but all the literature of the East and the West, philosophical and religious, I have not come across a more sophisticated, a more profound definition of God. It is a definition which is so precise, so clear. Uh, I'll, there's one thing we can, I can really uh, promise that you will not leave this room today without a clear idea of at least what is meant by God in the Upanishads. And unforgettable. So clear, so precise, and sublime. Philosophically sophisticated. And yet further, will not leave this room not only without an idea of what exactly God is, but also, and I may dare to say this, will not leave this room without finding God. Before this definition, we are seekers of God. After this definition, you can no longer say, I am seeking God. You have found it. You know exactly what God is and where God is. So, this is what is there on the table in front of us this morning. Um, let's go into this. I shall demand undivided attention. I usually do, but this time I really mean it. <laughs> because, because the definition unfolds like a mathematical proof. You'll see for yourself. You'll see how precise and deeply connected it is. If we miss one step of that, we'll be lost. So we must walk together. And I'll again warn you, I'll flag it when we come to the crucial portions. The text which I shall be using this morning is from one of the major Upanishads, the Taittiriya Upanishad, the second chapter of the Taittiriya Upanishad, the first paragraph of the second chapter of the Taittiriya Upanishad. The second chapter is called Brahmananda Valli, the chapter dealing with the bliss of Brahman. Brahman is the name for God in the Upanishads in Vedanta. Brahman. So the question is, what is Brahman? Can we define Brahman? The text starts with a short sentence which encapsulates the entirety of Vedanta. It says, it goes like this. Brahma Vedapno Tiparam The knower of Brahman attains the highest. Brahmavit apnoti param. The knower of Brahman attains the highest. In this little sentence, I feel all of religion and spirituality has been poured into this little sentence. There is something called Brahman. That's one. Second, it is possible to know Brahman. And third, by knowing Brahman, we attain whatever we could have wanted in life. The knower of Brahman attains the highest. Now three questions come to us when we hear such a thing. First of all, what is this blessed Brahman you're talking about? What exactly is it? Can you define it for us? Number one. Number two, you speak of knowing Brahman. We would like to know how do you know Brahman? What do you mean by knowing Brahman? And number three, attainment of the highest. What do you mean by the highest? What exactly are we going to get after all this? So three questions. What is Brahman? How do you know Brahman? And three, what do you mean by attaining the highest when you know Brahman? The next sentence clarifies, gives answers. Next few sentences give answers, gives us the answers to these three questions. You know, these questions uh, are, in brief, you will get the answers. Tadesha bhyukta, it is said in response to these possible questions. Satyam jnanam anantam brahma yo veda nihitam guhayam parame vyoman so ashnute sarvan kaman brahmana sahabipaschiteti Now, what has been said here? Brahman is infinite existence knowledge. Existence knowledge 
infinity is Brahman. That's the answer to the first question. When you ask what is Brahman, the answer to that question is Brahman is existence, knowledge, infinity. Satyam, Jnanam, Anantam. How do you know this Brahman? Yovedanhitam guhayam parame vyoman. Who knows Brahman as the reality shining within his own heart? Who knows Brahman as I am that Brahman? It's a poetic way of saying I am Brahman. You have to know Brahman in this way. And attainment of the highest, what do you get out of it? The answer is so Ashnute, that person, that enlightened person enjoys, attains Sarvan Kaman, whatever you want, whatever one could want in life, all of that. Well, all of that is what we are trying to get. We, we have got an education, we've got um, a family life, relationships, we are achieving things in the world. We are trying to get what we want in life. Well, all of that you are trying to get and not too successfully, little by little, all of that at once and forever. At one stroke you get everything. Well, incredible. And you'll say, okay, I'm sold. <laughs> I, I need to get me some of that Brahman. <laughs> <laughs> well, we are not concerned with the whole of it. All these things we, we spoke about. We are only concerned about this morning with the first question. What is Brahman? How do you know Brahman? And how do you get that which is promised? That's later. The second question I'll deal with in detail in uh, August, in my lecture in August. And the third question, <laughs> attainment of all that one could possibly hope for in life, is I'll, I'll deal with that question in September. <laughs> there are two other lectures coming up. But today, the crucial question, what is Brahman? And I shall direct our attention to that sentence, Satyam Jnanam Anantam Brahma. Satyam, reality, existence, truth, jnanam, knowledge, anantam, infinity, is Brahman. Now I'm flagging it. Here onwards, full attention. Hmm? Little children would screw up their faces and look carefully, yes, and go red in the face with all the attention they are giving. We need to be like that, present for this. There is a way of going about expanding this de definition. In computers, you have something called a zip file, where you take many files and you uh, zip it up into one file, compress it. When you need to use it, you need to unpack, unzip that file. In the same way, one needs to unzip this definition of Brahman. Definition of God, the word for God in Vedanta is Brahman. Definition of Brahman, we need to unzip it. And there is a way of going about it. This is what I invite you all to follow. The way is this. You start with the word Brahman. The word Brahman starts very simply. The word Brahman literally means that which expands without limit. Brahman is that which swells, literally the word bring adhatu, it means to swell or expand without limit. It literally means, if you translate it to English, it will mean the vast. Note that it is impersonal. There is no he or she. It's not a person. It's just called the vast. The vast what? A vast um, house, a big, um, or, or, or a vast country, or a vast space. It's not qualified. They don't say vast what? Just vast. When you say just vast, without anything attached to it, you know, a vast ocean or a vast heart, nothing like that, just vast, it literally means infinite. Just vast, without any qualification, means infinite, without any limit. And the word which is next to, just preceding the word Brahman, is anantam. The Sanskrit word anantam literally means no limit. Vast, Brahman means vast, and the word just preceding it means exactly what the meaning of vast is. No limit. Anantam. Antam in Sanskrit means limit. Anantam means no limit. 
Now, let us explore this word, no limit, unlimited, infinite. What is limit? What do you mean by limit? To understand the unlimited, we must understand what is meant by limit. In Vedanta, we speak of three kinds of limits. Three kinds of limits. Something is made limited, finite, in three ways. What are they? Desha Kala Vastu. Desha means space. Kala means time. Vastu means object. Limits are limits in space, limits in time, and limits in object. Wait for it. I mean, that sounds a little peculiar. One might already begin to understand what is meant by limit in space and limit in time. But what is limit in object? It will we'll come to that. It's a very interesting concept. But let's first start with what is meant by limit in space. Remember where, where, remember where we are in the definition. Brahman, the vast, unlimited, no limit. No limit, three kinds of limits. There are three kinds of limits. First kind of limit, limited, limited in space. Limited in space means something is located here and not there. The very fact that you are, you are here in the Vedanta society sitting in the temple means that you are not in the bookshop or on the freeway or at home. You are here. That means you are limited in space. We are every object that we know about, all the physical objects that we know about are limited in space. They have a beginning and they have an end in space. This is where they are and that's not where they are. So everything has a limit in space. Mm. California, big state, has a limit in space. After some time it becomes, becomes uh, Arizona or Nevada or some other state. The United States, big country, vast, but it has a limit. After some time it becomes either the Atlantic Ocean or, the, or Canada or uh, Mexico or the Pacific. So everything is limited in space. Now imagine something has no limit in space. The definition tells us unlimited in space without any limit. If something has no limit in space, what would, you, uh, what would it be? What would happen to it? If something has a limit in space, it is here and not there. If something has no limit in space, you cannot say it is only here and not there. You have to say there is no place where it is not. There is no place where it is not. not. There is no location in space where it is not. If it is not limited in space. So Brahman, by definition, is something that is not limited in space. So there is no place, no space where it is not. The word for that used in religion is omnipresent. So Brahman is omnipresent. This is the first result that we have got. We have to proceed very mathematically. The first result that we have got from this definition is Brahman, whatever it is, one thing we now know, it is something that has to be unlimited in space, omnipresent everywhere. Second, the other kind of limit we can speak about is limit in time, kala, in time. The second kind of limit. And the Upanishad says, Anantam, no limit in time. What is a limit in time? A limit in time means something exists after its creation and before its destruction. In between birth and death, we exist. Before the birth, this body was not there. After death, this body will not be there. Before its production, creation in a factory somewhere, this glass was not there. Now it is there. And there will come a time when the glass will be destroyed. It will be broken maybe. It's a broken glass. It's no longer a glass. And you will say the glass does not exist anymore. So after its destruction it will not exist. It is limited in time. It is cut off in time. So birth and deaths, death are limits in time. Creation and destruction are limits in time. Just about everything that we know in our life in this universe is limited in time. Everything is subject to birth. Everything is subject to death. In the, in the Gita, Sri Krishna says, Jatasya hi dhruvo mrityu. That which is born will certainly die. So that which is born will certainly die. There are limits in time. All our life is a little game we play between these two limits. Um, a Swami used to humorously say 
that what is life? What is life? And he says, you know, you're right. The person was born in 1920 and passed away in 2010. You, know, you write on, on the tombstone. So 1920 to 2010, and there's a little dash between that. And so the Swami would humorously say, what is life but a dash from the womb to the tomb? <laughs> that little, little dash. And those two dates on the tombstone, they show us limit in time. Our time is limited. Now suppose there is something which is not limited in time. The definition says, Brahman, the vast, is not limited in time. Which means, there is no time about which we can say, before this Brahman did not exist. We cannot say that. Because it's not limited by birth. And we cannot say, there is, no, there is a time after which Brahman will not exist. There is no time previous to which Brahman did not exist. There is no time after which Brahman will not exist. That means it's not limited in time. Time does not cut off Brahman. The result we get here, mathematically, deriving it, Brahman is eternal. Brahman is beyond time. Brahman does not come into existence in time, does not disappear, go out of existence in time. Time does not demarcate Brahman. You cannot make a tombstone and put a date to Brahman, beginning and end of Brahman. No. So Brahman is not cut off in time. Brahman is eternal. That's the second result we have got from the little word, anantam, unlimited. Now come to the third kind of limit. If you remember, I had said limitation of space, limitation of time, limitation of object. The third kind of limit the third kind of limit is limitation of object. Let's investigate this. This is a very interesting concept. What do you mean by limitation of object? It's a simple concept, but a little peculiar way of thinking. When I say limitation of object, it means everything is itself and nothing else. So what is this? It's a glass. It's not a table. It's not the Swami. It's not a room. It's not, not the country, it's not a... So it, it's not anything except a glass. You call it the law of identity. A thing is identical to itself and different from everything else. So everybody, when you say, I have an identity card which you show on the airport, your passport or driving license, what does it tell you? What does that thing tell the TSA person? This person is such and such person and nothing else. You are Mr. or Miss or Mrs. So and so and nothing else and nobody else. So that is a limitation, an object. A thing is itself and nothing else. Precisely itself and nothing of the billions of other entities. Each entity is itself and separate from the billions of other and trillions of other entities. All right, suppose something does not have such a limit. Think about it. The mind boggles. Support some, suppose something does not have this object limitation. What would it mean? Object limitation means a thing is this and nothing else in the whole universe. No object limitation means there is nothing in the universe which is different from it. Object limitation means everything in the universe is different from it. It's only itself. No object limitation means Nothing in the universe is different from it. Follow this carefully. Nothing in the universe is different from Brahman. There is nothing in the universe apart from Brahman. There is no second thing apart from Brahman in the universe. No second is equal to non-dual. Non-dual is equal to Brahman is non-dual, Advaitam. The Sanskrit word is Advaitam. Let me repeat that. At this point, usually students say, back up a little bit. <laughs> what did you say? I said the object limitation means a thing is identical to itself and nothing else. Very good. No object limitation means that thing, if there is such a thing which has no object limitation, that means there is nothing different from it. If there is nothing different from it, there cannot be even one entity apart from it. 
So if there is not even a second entity apart from it, that becomes non-dual. Non-dual means a second thing. Dual means a second thing exists. Non-dual, there is no second thing apart from Brahman. Brahman is non-dual. Advaitam. Imagine that little word, anantam, unlimited, has given us these three powerful results. One, if something is unlimited, you are saying Brahman is unlimited, you are defining Brahman as unlimited, then it must be omnipresent. It can, it's not limited in space. It must be eternal. It is not limited in time. And it must be non-dual. There cannot be anything apart from Brahman. Non-dual. Advaitam. Brahman is Sarvabhyapi Nityam Advaitam in Sanskrit. All-pervading, eternal, non-dual. All of this is packed into this single word anantam. This anantam word can be translated as infinity. Now one thing, one thing we can immediately notice here. There cannot be two infinities. Advaitam means no second thing apart from Brahman. So there is no second thing apart from this infinity. So in mathematics, for example, you speak of numbers, different kinds of infinities. Thanks to the mathematician Cantor, we have a whole hierarchy of infinites in mathematics. So the infinity in Brahman, in, in Advaita Vedanta is not like a mathematical infinity. The infinity in Advaita Vedanta does not tolerate a second infinity. There can be no second thing apart from Brahman. There can be, if there is infinity, it must be only one infinity. So Brahman is not only non-dual, Advaitam, it's also one, Ekam. Ekam, Eva, Advaitam. One, only, non-dual. These are the results we have got so far. And remarkable in themselves. But a question arises. Alright, you can define it that way. It's an interesting concept. It's a beautiful abstraction, sophisticated philosophy. But is it real? Does such a thing exist? Something which is eternal, all-pervading and non-dual. Does such a thing exist? If it does exist, then you are already in trouble. Because something that is all-pervading must be everywhere and something that is everywhere must be here. Something that is everywhere has to be here. Something that is eternal was, is and will be. Must be right now. If it's eternal, if it's there all the time, it must be right now. And something from which nothing is different, non-dual. Then in every object we should be able to discern that Brahman. Imagine the conclusion of that. If Brahman is eternal, all-pervading and non-dual, then Brahman must be right here, right now, in anything that I choose to see. Anything that I choose to experience, you should be able to show me Brahman. In conventional religion, there is a way out. I, I can say, yes, God exists, but um, God is in heaven, so that's why you can't see him right here, right? not right now. <laughs> not here, God is in heaven, there. Not now, God is after death. And if you are a good boy or a good girl, then only after death. Post-mortem. God is certainly not these things. God is apart from all these things. Now, I am safe if I say that because then you have to believe it. I'm not, uh, it's not my bounden duty to show you God anymore because God is not here, it's there in that place. Not now, after death, you can't catch me. And not in these things because God is apart from creation, the other. But the moment you say, moment Vedanta says God is everywhere, must be here. God is all the time, must be now. There is nothing apart from God. Then show me God in these things. Show me God in this glass then. In uh, one of the old stories in Indian uh, mythology, um, there's a little boy, Prahlada. And uh, he's a devotee of Vishnu. And his father is a great demon king who hates Vishnu. And finally, Hiranyakashipu, and tortures the little boy. And one day they have this big fight, the little boy and his father. And uh, the father says, well, where is your Vishnu? Where is your precious Vishnu? Supposed to be everywhere. 
And the boy says, yes, my Lord is everywhere. God is everywhere. And then, remember, they're in a the palace with huge pillars and all. So his father points to this pillar and says, is your precious God Vishnu in this pillar? And the boy says, yes, he is in the pillar. And the story goes, the, it's very dramatic. The father kicks the pillar in fury. The pillar, he's a demon, so the pillar sh shatters. And this terrifying form emerges from the pillar. Half man and half lion. It's called the Nrisimha Avatara, the incarnation of God in the form of man lion. It's a terrifying form of God. God takes a terrifying form to protect the little boy, to protect his devotee. And that uh, demon comes and kills the, uh, the, 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 the form of terrible form of God comes and kills the demon. That's a story. It's a famous story. And it's enacted again and again in uh, plays throughout villages and cities in India, even till today. I have seen so many enactments of it. And the high point is when the little boy says, yes, my God is in that pillar. And the father kicks that pillar down. So that's the, like the climax of the, uh, of the drama. And there will be this person dressed up in a wig and everything in a mask and who will jump out of the, with a terrible roar out of the pillar and all. Now in one of the plays, this is a story which actually hap this happened. Uh, the person who was a witness told me. It was enacted by little boys from our school, the Ramakrishna Order in, in, in Calcutta. And uh, the little boy who was acting, uh, the, acting the role of the devotee, the little child, uh, Prahlada, uh, he was a very smart kid. Now he knew where the man lion, God in the form of the man lion, which, uh, behind which pillar he is hiding. There were two pillars, unfortunately. <laughs> and, and the demon king, who's also another, another little boy, uh, he shouts, roars, where is your precious God? Is he behind this pillar? And the little boy knew that if he kicks that pillar and falls down and God doesn't come out, everybody's going to laugh. So, and the people are in the audience, you know. So the little boy replies, no, he's behind this pillar. <laughs> But Brahman is omnipresent, has to be everywhere. I should be able to show God in this glass or in this table and everywhere. And that is indeed what the Upanishad does next. Incredible, in a remarkable piece of um, philosophical insight, spiritual insight, the Upanishad proceeds to show us God indeed in every entity of this universe. Let's see how it does that. Now we have got two words. Brahman and Anantam, the vast and the infinite, no limits. Remember the first two words, in case you have forgotten, I'll remind you. Reality, Satyam, Jnanam, knowledge. Reality and knowledge, infinity is Brahman. Let's take up one word now, reality. It, the word Satyam in, in Sanskrit, it stands for truth. It stands for reality. Um, it stands for existence. Now, the Upanishad asks us to consider, consider reality. Look around you, what do you consider real? Don't be philosophical, be common sense. What do you consider real? Well, I consider my body to be real, and this room to be real, and all these people to be real, these pews, and this carpet, and this everything, all these things are real. Even the space between us is real, and um, the world outside is real. There are hundreds and thousands of real things, living and non-living surrounding all of us. Now the Upanishad says, apply the definition. If it is real, it must be God, because the definition said, reality, knowledge, infinity is Brahman. So what is reality it must be Brahman. So let's look at these real things. Are they Brahman? But here is a huge problem. You have just defined Brahman as no limit. No limit in space, no limit in time, no limit in object. Take up any of the things which we consider to be real. This thing, is it limited in space? <laughs> Very obviously, Swami, it's only in your hand, nowhere else. Is it limited in time? Did it have a time of creation and a time when it will be destroyed? Certainly, Swami. No one heard of an, uh, of an eternal uh, uh, glass cover or something like that. And is it limited in object? Yes. There are things which this is, it's only this and different from everything else in this entire room. So it's limited in space, it's limited in time, limited in object. How can it be Brahman? Do you see the contradiction here? In, in one word, 
Brahman say uh, the open the definition says what is real is Brahman. So this is real. How is this Brahman? In another word, the Upanishad says Brahman is infinite, not limited in time, not limited in space, not limited in object. Do you see the contradiction? What we consider to be real is definitely limited in time, definitely limited in space, and definitely limited by all, all other objects of the universe. How can they be? How can both of these words, infinity and reality, apply to the same thing? So here is a problem, a contradiction. The things which we consider to be real, the Upanishad says the real is Brahman, but the things which we consider to be real are very much limited in time, space and object. The Upanishad insists Brahman is both reality and unlimited, omnipresent, eternal, non-dual. Well, nothing we see around us is omnipresent, eternal or non-dual. Then we are, at an, we are at an impasse. What do you do? Upanishad is not given to speaking nonsense, self-contradiction. If you have self-contradiction, one of the strategies used in the Upanishads is, if you have language which is self-contradictory, then we must take an implied meaning. I'll repeat that. If what we find in the Upanishad, the language, the direct meaning is not matching, is not fitting. The same definition gives us two meanings which are mutually contradictory. Reality means these objects. Infinity. None of these objects are infinite. Then what do you do? The accepted norm is to take an implied meaning there. What is meant here, let us see. The Upanishad says, look at, make a list of the things that you see around yourself. The reality. Your reality. All right. My body and so many other people are there and there are these chairs and tables. Upanishad says, how do you experience these realities? When you say glass is, you experience glass as, if it is real, it exists. When we say something is real, we mean it exists. So glass is real. When you say elephant is not real, it means there is no elephant in the room. When you say glass is real, you mean there is a glass in the room. It exists. So reality means things which exist. So glass exists. The lectern exists, the Swami exists, the audience exists, the temple exists. And the Upanishad Vedanta tells us, look, the Swami and the glass and the lectern and the temple, they are all different from each other. They are different entities. But concentrate on the sense of existence. The glass exists, the glass is. The table is, the Swami is, the audience is. Now focus on that is. We never pay attention to that humble is. But it means existence. It means being. Now when you look at that isness, the very isness, the being, instead of saying that the glass is, or the table is, or the Swami is, or the people, they are, everybody is, is, exists, exists. Think of it as one ocean of existence in which the glass, the table, the swami, the people, everything, they are waves in that ocean of existence. The waves are all different from each other, different names, different forms, different functions. Nama, Rupa, Vyavahara, they are different from each other, but it is one existence everywhere. Now apply that word infinity to this existence, to this sense of existence. Infinity means it must be not limited in space. Not limited in space, omnipresent. Focus on this. The sense of existence, is it omnipresent or not? Yes. Whatever space you can think of, from here to the furthest galaxy, things exist. There must be existence there. Even empty space exists. So existence is without any barrier omnipresent. There is no limitation, no cutting off to existence. Think about it. Glass is different from the cover of the glass. But glass exists, cover exists. The existence is not different. It is one continuous ocean of existence. We are not used to thinking about it that way. But let's try thinking about it. It's like there are many, many waves and bubbles and foam in the ocean and spray in the ocean. But it is one continuous mass of water. Instead of looking at the waves, big and small, instead of looking at the surf, 
Look at the water. You will find one unbroken mass of water. In the same way, here, look around you. Feel it around you. From our birth till today, we have continuously been experiencing being, existence, isness. We don't focus on that. We focus on the name and the form. Here is a person, is a good person, is a bad person. Here is a nice thing, here is something tasty, here is something bitter. Here is something I want, here is something I do not want. Forgetting, overlooking the crucial fact that all of this, nice and bad, wanted and unwanted, cheap and expensive, whatever it is, is. There is a being to it, an isness to everything. That isness is not limited by space. Is it limited by time? Somebody will say, well, I can break this precious glass and the glass is not. Well, Vedanta would say, the broken glass is, correct. Glass is, break the glass, broken glass is. Pound it into powder. Powdered glass is. Put it in an atom smasher and pound it into sub-nuclear particles. Is. Is. Suppose you destroy all the glass in the universe. Well, the table is then, other things is. They are, the existence is there. Suppose you destroy everything in the universe. Let's just conceive of it. Everything is destroyed. Then where is the isness? There's a subtle bit of analysis there. And the commentator Shankaracharya points out, names and forms manifest isness. When the names and forms are not there, everything is resolved back into the, the maya. Then the isness continues, but it's not experienceable anymore. I'll repeat that. Names and forms manifest existence. Existence lends being to these names and forms. They exist because of pure existence. And what do they do for pure existence? They manifest pure existence. They enable us to experience pure existence. Pure in existence in itself is not an object of uh, experience. It is experienceable only through names and forms. Objects exist. They, they borrow existence from pure existence and they come into existence. And we experience the objects and the existence in them. If the objects are not there, pure existence according to Vedanta continues but is not experienceable anymore. And one more thing, if that pure existence is not limited by space, is not limited by time, is not limited by object. Think about it. Is there any object apart from existence? If it is apart from existence, it is non-existent. By sheer logic, you don't have to go and search. Let me try to locate an object apart from existence. Just sheer logic. If anything is apart from existence, it is non-existence. It's not abstract philosophy. It's not you know dry um, um, hair-splitting philosophy. It's what we are living right now. Feel it. The sense of being, the sense of presence, all around us. The ground of our very existence, the ground on which we play this drama we call life, is being itself. That's everywhere. Nothing can be there without being. It's, it's, it's a truism. It's a logical truism. Without existence, things become non-existent. So everything depends. Like saying, can we have a wave without the water? Can we have golden ornaments without gold? Can we have wooden furniture without the wood? If you take the wood out of the pews you're sitting on, you'd be pretty soon sitting on the carpet. Because the pews cannot exist without the wood. Similarly, nothing in the universe can, can be there without existence. So existence is not apart. There is nothing apart from existence. There is no second thing apart from existence. Existence is non-dual. Now we have a matching correlate. Brahman is not limited by space, not limited by time, and there is no second thing apart from Brahman. Brahman is non-dual. We have found Brahman. Where? In the existence of everything in the universe. There is not one thing in this universe apart from Brahman. Not only that. One more step. Go to the next word. Knowledge. Knowledge. Remember? Reality. Knowledge. Knowledge. Infinity is Brahman. Knowledge. What do you consider to be knowledge? We consider everything to be knowledge. 
I am seeing you, Swami, it's knowledge. I am listening to your voice, I am hearing your voice, that's knowledge. I am thinking, it's knowledge. 2 plus 2 is equal to 4, that's knowledge. All these thoughts we have are different kinds of knowledge. So are they Brahman? The definition says knowledge is Brahman, so are they Brahman? But unfortunately, you apply the definition, space, time and object, it doesn't cut, cut uh, it doesn't pass muster. Uh, knowledge. That knowledge which is in the Guru's mind is not in the disciple's mind. That's why the Guru is a Guru and the disciple is a disciple. That knowledge which is in the book is not it in my mind. I need to read the book. So, knowledge, space limitation. Some knowledge is here, some knowledge is there. Time limitation. There are not things which I knew and have forgotten. There are things I do not know. I shall, I shall know them eventually. Time limitation. Every moment we are getting different kinds of knowledge. You had one kind of knowledge coming into the room. You have got one kind of knowledge now. When we leave the room, we will have another kind of knowledge. The things we will see and hear and understand. And they are all cut off by time. In fact, knowledge changes fast. Our experience is fleeting. And our, is any knowledge... Non-dual? No. Every bit of knowledge we have got, what we see, what we hear, what we think, they're all different from each other. They're cut off by object. Object limitation applies to knowledge. So how is knowledge infinite? How can knowledge be Brahman? How can knowledge be Brahman? Apply the same logic. If you have followed the logic of existence or reality is Brahman, apply it to knowledge. Look at our knowledge. The experience that we gain throughout the day, from morning till late night when we go off to sleep finally, all the experience that we are getting, thousands of bits of knowledge being processed by our minds. What is common to all of them? And now you've been coming to Vedanta long enough, you should save consciousness, Swami. Yes. Anything that we know, is it not true that it is in our awareness? Every bit of knowledge is, I am aware of this class, I am aware of this person, Swami, I am aware of your voice. Awareness, sentience, consciousness is common to every knowledge. It's a truism again. Without consciousness, there is no knowledge. There is no understanding, no cognition, nothing is possible without consciousness. The things, the objects of consciousness are different from each other. They are limited by space. They are limited by time. They are limited by object. But... Consciousness itself is common to all knowledge. Every knowledge is, is grounded in consciousness. And that pure consciousness has no limitation of time, space or object. With that which is aware of, those are different from each other. But pure consciousness in itself is not limited by desha, kala, vastu, space, time and object. So, this pure consciousness... This pure existence is the real meaning of reality knowledge. In Sanskrit, it is the pure existence is called Sat. Sat. In Sanskrit, the pure knowledge, pure consciousness is called Chit. So Sat, Chit, Anantam is Brahman. Pure existence, pure consciousness is Brahman. Pure existence, pure consciousness, infinity is Brahman. This pure existence is what we experience throughout our lives. This definition just draws our attention to it. This pure consciousness is shining through our everyday experience. Whether you see something, hear something, smell something, it's that pure consciousness shining forth. It is the light within our hearts which enables us to experience our lives. The movies of our lives are played on the screen of this pure consciousness. This pure consciousness is neither created nor destroyed. It does not come into being. It does not go out of being. It is not limited to the objects which it is aware of, which it illumines. That pure consciousness is Brahman. The definition of Brahman with which we are familiar. Sat, Chit, Ananda. Existence absolute. Consciousness absolute. And bliss absolute. The bliss aspect we will deal with in September. But, but very briefly... Anantam Brahma, infinity is Brahman. In another part of the Upanishad it is said, that which is infinite is joy. That which is infinite is joy. Nalpe um, sukhamasti. Bhumaiva sukham. That which is infinite is joy. 
our unhappiness comes out of a sense of limitation that i am to die one day that the things i love will be taken away from me one day that my power of enjoyment will go away one day these limitations are what gives me unhappiness when i am infinite i have a sense of infinity that sense of infinity is itself joy they say it's a mass of joy it's an ocean of joy so satyam means sat reality means pure existence knowledge gyanam it means chit your consciousness and how do you get this meaning by using the word anantam not limited this not limited existence this not limited consciousness is itself joy ananda bliss what is this it is you yourself your true nature the definition tells us next sentence it will tell us you have to know this as i am brahman it will not do you any good to know know it as brahman is pure existence pure consciousness well that's nice good for brahman but what what does it do for me the very next sentence will tell us you have to realize this as yourself as the light shining in your heart yo veda nihitam guhayam that pure existence consciousness bliss in your very heart that means in your very awareness in the very core of your existence that's what we are don't even say my brahman say i am brahman brahman is not like your liver or kidney huh? <laughs> i am brahman before this definition i am a human being in search of god i am trying to find god after this definition i am pure existence consciousness bliss in me this human personality shines it appears in me it exists in me and it will one day disappear into me i am that infinite ocean in which all these beings arise arise like waves they play with each other they fight with each other they disappear back into me mai ananta maham bodo aashcharyam jeeva vichaya udyanti gnanti khelanti pravishanti swabhavata in the ashtavakra gita it is said i am an infinite ocean of existence see the same the infinite ocean of existence and consciousness in me these ascharya wonderful entities called living beings arise as waves and what do they do khelanti they play with each other love affection all this getting together relationships gnanti they fight with each other war and divorce and, and envy and jealousy and then finally what happens pravishanti is they subside back into the ocean which i am so this is the definition of brahman that we find in the upanishads i have got exactly a couple of minutes in those couple of minutes let me quickly sketch out the whole thing which we covered today the definition of brahman given in the taittiriya upanishad is existence or or reality knowledge infinity is brahman start with the word brahman it means vast vast without any limits that is equal to infinity infinity means no limit limits are of three types space time and object not limited in space means omnipresent nowhere that it is not not limited is in time means there is no time when brahman is not and not limited by object means there is no object that is not brahman it must not there is no object which can exist separately from brahman now let's try to find brahman look at reality look at the things which we consider to be real in our lives everything that we consider to be real in our lives vedanta tells us notice that all these things are different from each other they are all limited by time space and object but the sense of reality that we have in all of them isness being pure existence itself that is neither limited by space nor limited by time nor is it different from any object any object that's different from existence becomes non existent so there is something not limited by time space something that is omnipresent something that is eternal something that is non dual that is pure existence we cannot say that we do not know it in fact that's all that we experience all throughout our lives we do not notice it come to knowledge every experience we have in life good and bad religious and secular spiritual and not so spiritual everything in life 
is based in consciousness. The experiences are all different from each other. They are limited in time. They are limited in space. They are limited by object. They are different from each other. But the consciousness underlying all experiences, that which lights up our sense of existence and experiencing, that is one and unchanging. Then the Upanishad tells us, that is what you are. That's what we are. All of us are that one unchanging, infinite existence, infinite consciousness. When? All the time. Even before you come to the Vedanta class, even after you go away from the Vedanta class, you are that. It's only when we own up to this fact, only when we acknowledge this fact, that we are not limited by this little, little personality, which is born, the body was born, the personality has developed, it will change and then age and the body will die and that's it. No. You are not the wave which has come up, which is now there, which will subside back into the ocean. You are veritably the ocean itself. In you, in your awareness, in your existence, this little life is playing out. Not only this little life, all lives, all bodies are playing this cosmic drama. On, you are the very ground of existence. You are one with God. You are God. Tat Tvamasi. That thou art. The student responds to this by saying, Aham Brahmasmi. I am Brahman. The whole purpose of Vedanta, the purpose of religion, is to bring us to this point. When we come to, come to this point and make it not just a theoretical understanding, but a living reality. It's a visible reality. With eyes closed and eyes open, all we, our attention is focused on pure existence, consciousness and bliss. Then we are enlightened and then alone we are free. We don't have to go away from this world. We don't have to shut our eyes to this world. You see Brahman with eyes open. I'll end with this. I just remembered about um, 10 or 12 years ago, I met this strange monk in the Himalayas. Old person, I don't know if he's still alive. He used to live in this little hut for the last 40 to 50 years. He's been living like that in Gangotri. And he said to me, I still remember sitting there, towering mountain tops, glaciers running down, the Ganges running very fast, just about 100, 200 feet below us, pine trees all around, Devala trees. And he says to me, quotes from the Rig Veda, Pashya Devasya Kabhyam Yona Jiryati Na Mamara Look upon the poetry of the Lord which neither decays nor dies. The universe itself is the poem of the Lord. The Lord is pure existence and consciousness. And that is what we all are in our heart of hearts, in our core of existence. We are that. Whether we accept it or not, whether we believe it or not, whether we understand it or not. Understanding is in the mind. It's a secondary thing. More important than the, that is the fact we are existence, consciousness, bliss. Om Sahana Vavatu Sahana Bhunaktu Saha Viryam Karavavahe Tejasvi Navadhi Tamastu Mavid Vishavahe Om Shanti 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 Om May the Lord Protect us together, those the one who has spoken and those who have listened. May we both when we all may we all be protected by this spiritual knowledge. May we get the fruits of this knowledge, that is the peace and joy, abiding peace and joy in our life. May we achieve great things in the light of this spiritual knowledge in the life remaining to us. May what we have studied here today light our lives, may it illumine our lives. May there be harmony amongst us, may there be no discord amongst us. Om, peace, peace, peace.